it's uh, now come to 8 a.m. Time for this morning's Dhamma talk. And we are coming closer uh, to the so-called end of the retreat. But of course, there's so many uh, hundreds of thousands of seconds left. And sometimes that when you start to talk about end of retreat, sometimes we're like one fellow, when I was a school teacher, he'd uh, got another job in another in a government department, a very good job. He was a school teacher when I was there. And he said something to me, which I'll always remember. He said that he called himself, he had to do another three or four months at school before he could get his job. And he said he found himself wishing three or four months of his life away. And that's a lot of his life when you're waiting for something to happen. You're waiting for another job, waiting for another thing to, to occur. And really, our life is not that long. And the idea of wishing part of your life, OK, when this happens, then I'll be happy. It was something which I saw so often in people's lives. You really wanted to try and stop that. Because once you get the new job, then oh, it's only another six months until my probation is finished and then I can uh, get uh, security in this job. Only another 12 months and then you get married. Only another 12 months and you have a kid. And only another 12 months and then I die. <laughs> Sometimes just look, looking at the future like that is just a little bit crazy. And that's one of the reasons why. That even though you can say only one more day and a half, and then this thing finishes here. It's a nice sort of being a Buddhist monk because this meditation retreat never finishes. When I leave here, I go over there. When I go leave there, I come back here. So it's always this wonderful thing of uh, retreat all the time. But whether you call it a retreat or not, here we focus mostly on our meditation, on developing our mind, giving it strength. But it's not just, it's not just getting beautiful experiences in meditation. It's not just getting health benefits. It's something which transfers to our ordinary life. And we learn how to deal with problems in our meditation and the same solutions work in your life. It's one of the reasons why this is almost like a, a laboratory where we test out these techniques, a training ground where we learn how to make our minds stronger and a place where we can learn and grow so much. And some of the teachings which we give here, like in the suttas, I must admit, sometimes they get very complicated. And if you've just done a lot of meditation, a lot of theories, understanding of Buddhism, that's fine. But then the mostly the ordinary things in life, the ones which are the most effective. And this is uh, the time of goodness, no monk sitting next to me today that I do this little exercise, this little um, demonstration, because this is what Ajahn Chah taught me once. It's such a simple one-minute teaching, but it meant so much to me. I was walking back after arms round, I think I was carrying his bowl at the time, looking after him, and then he stopped by the side of the path. And it was such an important thing, I remember where he did that. And one day when I was with some other monks and walking the same path, I pointed it out to them. This is where Ajahn Chah taught me this. And it was only an ordinary bit of um, scrub by the side of the, the road, going to one of the villages. And he took up a, a stick just lying by the side of the road. And then he just asked me, he said, Brahm, is this heavy? That's why I was glad there was not a monk over there. <laughs> Sometimes I did it with a bit too much energy <laughs> and almost hit it. <laughs> and with, it's only heavy when you hold it. And that was it, that was the teaching. Oh, wow. Something very simple and easy to understand, but how often is that in your life? It's something which you have to do when you go back. Stop holding it. You don't know what might happen. So many times in my life, I thought, oh, this is going to be terrible when I go back, something's going to happen, I'm going to be in big trouble or something, and then it doesn't turn out. It, the future never works out the way I expect it. It's usually much worse. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that as a joke. No, it's usually much better. So that's one of the reasons why that when uh, 
we are in a place like this, please enjoy every moment of it, as many moments as you can. And no need to pack your bags until maybe half an hour, an hour before you leave, because who knows, you may not have to leave. We never know what happens. So little by little, we learn just how to spend more time in this moment. And when you live in this moment, it's never perfect how you experience this moment. There's always things you know, go right, go wrong. That's one of the reasons why, that when we are uh, meditators, we learn how to allow everything into our heart. Not just the nice parts, but the unpleasant parts. In other words, whatever happens, we open the door of our heart, embrace it, learn from it, grow from it, and we don't get moved by it. This, I don't know if you've seen the mistakes on that floor, which we have over here. I often mention this story that they, this is life, building this place, oh crikey, you know, that I was responsible for this place. And so I do remember just you know, working with the builder and first of all, that I was giving a talk in Sydney and somebody had me, he sent a fax, the builder sent a fax to this place and they, it was getting close to finishing the, play, the uh, retreat centre. And in the fax he said that we had to now pay uh, the bill of the latest work, which is about $600,000. Now, it's very good that uh, you weren't the treasurer at that time, Peter, because you'd have thrown a fit too. So, ah, we haven't got that amount of money in the bank. But fortunately, I knew the builder and the, the person who recommended him to me. And I said, well, there's a couple of things in this account which I think we should have a look at, first of all. And so they had a look at a few things in those accounts. It gave us time to raise some more money and stuff like that. But it was very dodgy, made very often. You know, in my life as a Buddhist monk, trying to raise funds for these things, we're always on the edge. I kind of like that. I think it was David Bowie, wasn't it, who said, uh, <laughs> live life on the edge. You know David Bowie? You know he's a Buddhist? Yeah. He went to, um, <laughs> he went to the centre in London, the London Buddhist Society. And whenever I go to London, I always try and give talks over there because you know, it's one of the places I used to go to when I was first a monk. And they're always really supportive, they're very open. And so I saw David Bowie went there. I thought one time that when I was going over there to raise funds for uh, Venerable Chandra's monastery over in England, that I may be able to meet David Bowie and get him to do a concert for... <laughs> <laughs> Didn't quite work, but it was a nice hope. But anyway, the, when those things happen, Oh, they don't happen the way they should do. I never expect them to happen the way they should do. But I know that I can always make something out of what, what happens. And you know, when things go wrong, it always gets better. Like I say, the floor over here, for those of you who don't know it, this floor over here uh, was, uh, was, was bare the night, before, the night before we were having our grand opening ceremony. And we had a, a lot of VIPs coming. One of the VIPs who came was Jeff Gallup, because you know, the meditation over here and some of the teachings we gave him really helped him get through his depression. That was another thing. You know, I thought I came so close to changing the world, because I had the plan. Because Jeff Gallup, you know, when he got, um, uh, he, he got really friendly, and we went to go and see him a lot, and he used to come down here, and then, and then I knew that he was very close to the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, because they were at Oxford together. And even that um, Jeff Gallup was Tony Blair and Cherry Blair's best man at their wedding ceremony. So they were really close together. And I thought, great, this is my plan. <laughs> Once I've really converted Jeff Gallup, then the next number two, would be Tony Blair, <laughs> and he was a big friend of uh, President Bush. <laughs> so then I could convert President Bush, and then once the United States was Buddhist, <laughs> there'd be no more problems in the world. <laughs> and, 
I teach them just the way that the Thai government dealt with the communists over there. And now they're working in the, in the government, supporting. But all those little things over there, they all came to nothing, of course. <laughs> but nevertheless, it was a nice little <laughs> dream. But life works out much better than your dreams. Because anyway, he was coming the next day. It was just Easter time. And you know what happens with plans? And I talked to the builders. Are you sure it's going to be finished in time? And they said, it'll be finished in February. Are you sure? I remember they say, are you doubting our professional competence? <laughs> well, I was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, it wasn't finished in February. It was finished just before we... Well, actually, it wasn't finished. <laughs> the day before the ceremony. Oh, the, the, all the, we had all the, the bamboo flooring, but it wasn't finished. So what, what are we going to do now? And the builder just got all sorts of people ringing them up, and they came, now we're not going to do this. It was the day before Easter. These Australian workers... And they don't work overnight and on, New Year, uh, on Good Friday Eve. They've got work to do down the pub. <laughs> <laughs> so they weren't here at all. So but what are we, we going to do? This whole half of the floor was, was concrete. And all these VIPs come in the next day. Not only VIPs, but starting the retreat. <laughs> what should we do? And of course, you know the story. Sort of, <laughs> to the rescue came the monks. <laughs> and especially Ajahn Santuti, I mean, he's over now at Kusli Hara. He came in here and Ajahn Bamali and all the other monks came in here. Right, we've got an opening in about 10 hours, it's the night time, let's get going. I think it usually might take a professional builders a couple of days to do this. They did this overnight. This area over here. Finished about 4 a.m. I don't remember that. Since they worked so hard. And 4 a.m. it was finished. And they had about one hour's sleep. And then get up because we had to prepare for the ceremony. Had a big ceremony. You've seen the ceremonies we have here. It just takes a lot of organising. But they finished it just in time. They showed me, just in the corner over there, if you have a look, sort of it, that, that corner piece over there doesn't match. <laughs> no, just, uh, and it, you can look at it later, find it later, the fault finding mine. <laughs> but I said, nobody notices that. But I thought, that's great that you did your very, very, very best. And it wasn't perfect. I didn't tell them afterwards at four o'clock in the morning, OK, tear it up and start again. <laughs> I learned from the, the pushing the wheelbarrows. Not over there, over here. No, not over there, over there, I told you. <laughs> but the point is they did it with fun, with joy, and lots of tea and coffee. <laughs> 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 a wonderful day afterwards. And I'm so happy that's how it worked. There are mistakes. People didn't, didn't do the right thing. But as a Buddhist, we say, that's life. We'll turn it into something good. And we did. And that was just the start of this retreat center. Brilliant. So little by little, you know, you learn you know, from your meditation. Yeah, you may you know, think it's gone all wrong or strange things happen in your meditation. Get these incredible limiters and then they disappear again. You learn so much more you know, when things don't go easy. I know it's very nice to think, I'll oh, just get enlightened and have it over and done with. But quite frankly, the more difficult it is for you, the more you learn on the way. And the wiser the teacher you become. That was one of those stories that says so easy, so, so many times when I was first a monk here. And that was the old truckload of dung simile. I said about <coughs> treading in the, in the dung and just putting it under the mango tree. But what happens if, when you go home after this nine-day retreat, you find that somebody has dumped about six or seven big truckloads of dung in front of your front door in your house? Sometimes that happens in life, you know. It's not your fault. 
we got this big truckloads of dung, stinking dung, right in front of your front door of your house. So what do you do with it? You got, first of all, you try and find out, you know, who dumped it here? And a lot of the times you cannot find the culprit. They've, they've gone. <laughs> Number two, you can't get anyone to take it away for you. You're stuck with it. So what do you do? When you're stuck with a truckload of dung, what do you do with it? You have to be innovative. And the innovation starts with a wheelbarrow and a spade. You take it around the back of your house and you dig it in. See another digging in the fertilizer simile. And sometimes when you get a whole six or seven truckloads of dung, it's really hard work. But it's much harder if you think, why me? But then you're stuck with it. All the complaining in the world doesn't help. But anyway, you start moving that dung. And after a while, it's like you're making no progress at all. Like in your life and the difficulties you have, you can't see anything working, progress at all. You have to keep pushing it around the back. But then something happens one day when you, know, when you least expect it usually. You see these little flowers and trees start to grow in the back garden. You start to see the back garden starting to become very fertile and very beautiful. And just after a few weeks, a few months, however long it takes, your garden is just incredible. And the scent of the flowers, the beauty of the trees is so amazing. But even your neighbours who walk past, they comment on it. And you have so much fruit, that you give it to all the neighbours. You share everything. And that's all come because of just how much dung you've had in your life. It's one of the reasons why when you have bad things happen to you, you never sort of complain about it. That just makes it worse. There are some people when they get a truckload of dung, you know what they do with it? They put it in their pockets. They put it in their bags, down their shirts, down their trousers. They carry it around with them. Now I'll tell you a very profound secret. If you carry around shit with you, you lose a lot of friends. <laughs> <laughs> no one likes to be close to you. That's one of the reasons why, oh yeah, you take it and you dig it in. And after a while you think, wow, it's great. More dung, you know, for my garden. And that sort of turns you into a very wise and also a very compassionate person. Not critical, understanding, and giving a lot of people space. In fact, in one sense, you're being quite, quite selfish when you're kind to others. You're not giving them any dung in front of their front door to carry around with them. But no, we all got enough dung in our life. So little by little, we learn from these things, whether it's in meditation, whether it's from life, just how to be a human being, how to be kind and caring, not expect very much. You usually find that most of the problems in life come from expecting too much. Now how many people at your work, you can go to work, your office or home or, or your monastery tomorrow. <laughs> That's me. And when you go back to work, oh, you've got to find out what's happened, who's done what, fix up all the problems, or fix up some of them. But one of the things I always know, I always expect there to be problems. Some years, I don't know, some months ago, I did go to visit one of our other branch monasteries down south, that's you know, the one we're hoping to build down in Albany. And people asked me when I came back, said, how is it down there, how are they going? I said, oh, it's amazing, it's amazing, it's wonderful down there, I was so inspired down there. I said, how can you do that? He said, very easy, I had no expectations. <laughs> Actually, my, it wasn't no expectations, really low expectations. Very low expectations, and so when I went down there, it wasn't that good, but because I had low expectations, I was very really inspired. That's how to be inspired. <laughs> Lower your expectations, and then whatever happens, it's much better than you expected. <laughs> 
But if you have high expectations, well, how on earth can you just be happy? No one can live up to those high expectations. It's not like a heavenly realm. This is not sort of a six-star resort. It's much better than that because you look up in the sky, there's thousands of stars in this resort. And little, <laughs> little by little, you understand this. The best resort, the best stars you can give is the stars of contentment. How content have you been on this retreat? If you haven't, whose fault was it? <coughs> Should we try and raise some more funds and make this the perfect meditation retreat? I don't think I told you this story yet, but I told the thing this to the Thai retreat earlier. I said, a good example of how we can improve this place. Your meditation cushions. Have a look at them, just they're so old fashioned, just round and, and totally low tech. <laughs> now, are you really comfortable? Do you get sore sometimes when you're meditating? Are you sometimes too hot or too cold? Or sometimes you get tired? How about developing a high tech meditation cushion? So you have it sort of, you know, the ordinary shape, but in many different compartments with all sorts of gizmos in there, and you have your remote, your remote control for your meditation cushion. So if you need the back to be lifted up a bit, you just press the button for the back, and it fills with air and your back lifts up, it becomes more comfortable. If you've got a sore knee, you can press the side here and the, the cushion comes up to raise the knee up. If it's too cold for you in the meditation room, you can always heat it up, just like they do with those Japanese toilets. Have you sat on those? They're really great. You just press the button on there, it gets really nice and warm. <laughs> and if you don't like the warm, it's too hot in here, you press another one. And this is uh, these jets of cool air, cool mountain air, fragrant air will come up and cool your every <laughs> And what I did do when I once uh, went on, on the business class in Singapore airline, you have a button and on the back it just massages you. So you can have one of those on your meditation cushion, the massage button, and you can massage you. <laughs> and that'd be really nice during your meditation so you don't get so sore. And you have another button there, because it is true that sometimes you get tired for coffee. <laughs> You press a button, you've got latte, you've got strong, you've got <laughs> flat, I, I don't know coffee though, flat white or long white or... Long white. <laughs> or fat white, I don't know. Long black. <laughs> long black. <laughs> you can take all your choices there, just how many um, honey or sugar or, or do you want any milk with that or cream or whatever and bang, bang, bang. <laughs> Now imagine having a high-class meditation cushion like that. I'm sure you can add more things and I'll just... <laughs> oh yeah, you can add also just um, another thing for questions. <laughs> you say, <laughs> I'm getting too excited, what should I do? And then you've got a little thing in the air and it's Atom Brown's voice says, when you get excited, please remember. <laughs> <laughs> now you can spend, obviously you understand where these ideas come from. Sometimes when I was meditating, I started to think, well, this is a good idea. <laughs> How can I improve this retreat center? But of, co of course, it reminded me of a little experiment which was done and the results were just surprising. This was in a meditation center in the United States. I think it was an IMS, International Meditation. Insight Meditation Society or something in, in Massachusetts. And what they decided to do, they were you know, pretty well endowed. So they said, let's, let's make this meditation center even better. And, but how do we know what our clients, the meditators, really want? So what they did, I haven't followed this idea. And Lay Harvest Retreat Manager, don't you ever do this. And that was actually having a complaints box. <laughs> you know, and they were saying it's not really sort of fault finding, but any suggestions how to make the retreat more comfortable 
and more appropriate for everybody. And so they put it up there and they announced it was there, welcome any suggestions. And it got full up the first evening. <laughs> it was stuffed with, with um, complaints. <laughs> and then I realized an important thing about life. The closer you get to perfection, the more critical people are. <laughs> when it's really rough and hopeless and whatever, you think, oh God, it's a waste of time complaining. <laughs> but the, the closer you get to perfection, that's when it's so close, why can't they just do this last piece, piece and it'll be perfect? Of course, it never gets perfect, does it? In life. Instead, of having the complaints box, instead of trying to get the perfect meditation cushion, instead of like, I don't know about you, but sometimes I sit in here and I'm hot. Other than, and I look, open my eyes and see a lot of you got blankets on, I thought, oh my goodness. And <laughs> 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 the other monks sometimes think like that as well. <laughs> so I thought, why can't we have our individual air cons? Just put it down like in the aircraft. You just listen to nice. The nice exactly what you want. <laughs> I don't know if it's practical or not, but anyway, it will still be not quite right. Mm -hmm. Because the demands when you want something, no matter how powerful you are, it's never satisfied. Even if you've got huge amounts of money and power and you design things you make it happen, it's never ever good enough. And that's why sometimes, you know, I like jokes, because jokes actually reveal some of human beings' sort of nature. And all the sort of the jokes about um, people finding little genies in bottles. And the genie comes out and said, you have a wish. What's your wish? And I remember there's the three Australians in the desert They'll be wandering in the desert, lost, tired, really afraid they may actually die. And they found a little bottle. I don't know how it got there. They rubbed it and a genie came out. And the genie said, according to my, uh, the tradition, you're allowed three wishes. That's one wish each. What would your wish be? And the first guy from Sydney said, oh, I wish I was back in Sydney in a pub having a nice big a glass of orange juice, I better be careful. <laughs> now having a beer or something. And is that what you want? I said, yeah. So he, the genie just bang, and he disappeared. And he appeared back in Sydney having a beer. And the other next guy said, well, you know, I'd like a drink, but I'm also hungry. I wish I was back in my favorite restaurant in Sydney, having a nice big meal, a nice big, Vietnamese meal. <laughs> <laughs> Bang! And he disappeared. And he was in, in Sydney in a nice Vietnamese restaurant having a lovely meal. And then one guy left. And the last guy said, have a wish. You're in the middle of the desert, about to die. What would you like? He said, I would really like a drink, but I'd also like a meal. But I'd like a drink too. So which one should I get? The meal in the... Vietnamese restaurant or a drink. I, I just can't decide. I wish my two friends were back here to help me. <laughs> so, <laughs> he wasn't popular when they came back. So anyway, you can see that sometimes the wish is, what do you want? And nothing really satisfies you. It's never enough. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why. When we understand this, the unfulfilled wishes, when things go wrong, when we don't get what we want, we get angry, upset. What do we do that for? Stupid. It means you're going to be angry and upset the whole of your life. And one of the things is also that once you get angry and upset, once you start looking at the bad things in life, that's all you ever see. In a beautiful place like Janaka, it's not perfect, 
but it's not that bad. For many people, it's amazing. You see people who come from retreats in other places, and they just can't believe how good this is. I was uh, <laughs> uh, what was that story? I don't, don't know if it's really relevant, but it just came up about one of those meditators. I could have told it the first night, but I think I told it in a previous retreat for the um, the Thais. This. I was hanging out in the reception area, helping out whenever I can help. Because even though I'm a monk, still you just like to be ordinary and find out what's going on and just help out in any way you possibly can. You never try to be sort of a, uh, this big leader everyone is scared of and you don't know really what's going on. You just try and melt, melt in there somewhere. Because I remember that when I did go to Vietnam many years ago for a conference, that's actually where I like to... Uh, extending just your knowledge by going to conferences of many different traditions and many different places. And this conference was in uh, Vietnam. And I remember this one because I gave my presentations, but there's other things to listen to. And one of the talks I was really interested in listening to, I went to the auditorium and sat in the back. And as I was sitting in the back, just minding my own business, waiting for the, the speaker co to come up, a Vietnamese monk sat next to me. And the reason why he sat next to me is because he just wanted to try and practice his English. <laughs> you know, that's, well, you know, that if you have good English, you can travel yourself. So this Vietnamese monk sat next to me and uh, he said, you know, I think so, good afternoon or something, not a bad accent. And then, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Australia. He said, oh, Australia, very good. And he said, um, do you know a monk in Australia called Ajahn Brahm? <laughs> 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 I didn't know how well I was known over there. Then I paused a bit and said, oh yeah, I know him. <laughs> He's a very good monk, I said. I said, oh, yeah, he's a very good monk. And then I, I said, actually, I am Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> and what he did next was unforgettable. Ah! <laughs> I'm sorry. It was really cute. But in a sense, I was also very happy that, you know, if you are well known, you don't just always go out there in front and always go there with an entourage and so you can't be actually met. I didn't have a bodyguard. <laughs> Do you need a bodyguard? Uh -uh. Your kindness is your bodyguard. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing which I, I learnt. I learned that mostly by going into prisons. And that one time going to the prison in Canning Vale, I think it's called Haikia now, but that time it just was called Canning Vale Jail. And it was a very, very um, tough jail at the time. They said psychologically it was very intense. And when I went there, because they got some very um, dangerous inmates there, and some of those inmates, you know, would rape you. Men. So, and many of the visitors had been assaulted. Some of those prisoners had basically nothing to lose. So anyway, so when I checked in there to go and teach my meditation class, they gave me this biro pen. I said, no, what do I need that for? He said, it's not really a pen. It's a security device. You had to do something to, to help all the visitors like you so you don't get raped by these men. And he said, if there's any trouble, take out the pen. And on the ceiling, there's all these little uh, uh, like smoke alarms. They're not smoke alarms, they're security devices. We only just put them in the last week or two. So if you get attacked, point it up you know, the nearest of the, secure, of the security alarms, press the button, we'll know where you are, we know you're in trouble, come and save you. So put it in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Mark, I don't have a pocket. <laughs> I just hold it. So I went into my class and as soon as I came in and sat down, 
So you've got one of those security alarms as well. <laughs> they all know what's going on. And then I said, yeah. And then the guy, he was the first guy who I met in the prison, the guy who said, he said, you know, years ago in Bunbury, he's still in jail, but now he's in Hakia. And he said, do you really think you have time to press that button? I think it was the one, first of all, sorry, who asked me, you know, if you meditate, can you fly over walls? <laughs> it was that guy. But then this was a couple of years later. And he said, do you really think you could press that button? Even think about it before I grabbed you and raped you. He was really serious. I said, possibly no. And of course he smiled and he said, correct, I'm way, way too fast in this jail. But he said, you know, because of all the times you've come to our jail, talked with us, never criticised us, never found fault with us, but, you know, cracked jokes with us. Because of that, there's many of the prisoners here, we like you. And these are the guys sitting in front. If any guys around the back there try anything, we'll get them first. He said, you're safe in here. And, you know, I really felt 100% safe. Probably more safe in that prison I won't say in the Buddhist society of West Australia, that's going too far. <laughs> <laughs> there are many other places I've been to giving talks. But it really struck me that those were dangerous people. But because you've shown kindness to them, that you were protected just by your good karma. And it's also the case that I know that if I, and if I was in Vietnam, and I got injured, attacked, or had a heart attack or something. In Thailand, in Malaysia, in Singapore, I wouldn't need uh, to have health insurance. Honestly, I'd be well looked after. In fact, what usually happens is the doctors, they try and compete who looks after me. No, you can't look after him, I look after him. No, no, you looked after him last time, it's my turn. No, no, no. It's weird, but it's really cute. Just like uh, the other day, two of our monks, they went for, uh, it was just after his birthday, and his parents wanted to invite him out for lunch. It's very hard to find a place which is open before noon, so you can finish a meal before lunch, but they found one in Burswood. <laughs> and when they said, it's okay, I jump if we go to Burswood for lunch. Where in Burswood? <laughs> Burswood is where the casino is. Yeah. When I first came here, it was the, the big monastery, and this was a small monastery here. So lots of Thai people went there for the weekend. <laughs> I <laughs> did. But anyway, when I, uh, so where he went to, but it was not that far from the casino, just no walking, you know, five minutes. But when he went there, he wanted to, his parents wanted to buy him lunch. Couldn't do it. Thai lady saw him. She bought the lunch for the parents as well. And the mother was just really sort of taken started to realise just what her son was doing. Mm -hmm. That people just wanted to sell monks her birthday. Oh, we'll, we'll, I think they got a big plate of noodles. I don't know if they wanted the noodles, but because it was given in such a beautiful way, mm -hmm. how lovely that was. As for me, uh, twice now, I've been to some sort of funeral ceremony or uh, something in the morning time and I can't get back here for lunch. And I was up in the, the south of the river in the, uh, the western part of the south, the southwest. And just I went into the shopping centre and just get some food there. And as soon as I went to the counter, just these Asian looking people, the young people, they came in and they looked at me and they went into the shop they brought out this little book, Opening the Door of Your Heart, with my, <laughs> my face on it. Is this you? 
said, yeah, I'm just getting some lunch, that's all. And of course, we had the lunch and more, all for free. I think they even gave us a donation as well afterwards <laughs> to take back to the monastery. And sometimes it's like touching the care which people give to you. And I just, when I receive that type of care, I feel I just really want to, number one, I can't go back there too often. <laughs> because it's so go broke. <laughs> so what you actually do, you try and you know, give them lots of kindness, but it really makes me feel just you know, part of the community, helping out, serving wherever you can. That's, to me, that's a beautiful part of things. How we can serve, look after one another, and give. Because in a retreat, you all have your own room. But you share the whole place. You may have you know, your own independence. But your mind state affects everybody else. And that's one of the reasons why when people do leave tomorrow, then they say, well, how can we share this with others? So some of you have got some great meditations, beautiful mind states, lovely insights. So you don't have to try to share it with others. How many people you, will you meet when you go home? It's not just the person you live with or your family. It's even the people you pass on the street. Even this is the people you just uh, meet at work. Even the people who you say, yeah, you can come in front of me on the freeway when it's jammed. All the kindness which you give, that is what you share. And that is, some of that is coming from what you learned on this retreat. What a beautiful thing that is. 60 people here, a few others as well, all getting some kindness and goodness in this retreat and learning about how to deal with disappointments and little by little how we can have a, a little wonderful little family here and take that example back to where you live. Sometimes just resting. One of the stories I, I haven't told you yet, which is one of my favorites again, there was a woman, and she was over in the United States. And when she came back after shopping for the weekend groceries, she you know, had all the bags in her hand, so she, she could just, just about turn the lock turn the, of the key of the front door of the house and just you know, kick the door open with her feet. So you know, she didn't really have much freedom to, to stop this dog who just ran right past her and into her house. <laughs> it was being like a Labrador dog. The dog went right past her into her house. She couldn't stop it. She didn't know who it was. So she immediately sort of got into the kitchen, pulled all her stuff down and went looking for this strange dog to find out where on earth he was. And she found the dog in one of the rooms, curled up on the carpet, already fast asleep. And it was a clean looking dog even had a collar on, it wasn't a stray, and it was just curled up there fast asleep. And no, she's a, it's a nice dog, and it's not doing any harm. Why not just let it have a snooze? And that's what the dog did. And she just you know, cleaned up things and, and uh, put things away and got things ready for the evening meal. And then she heard a little bark, not a very loud bark. The dog had woken up, and the dog was by the door looking at her, as if you know, she, she knew the dog. She didn't know the dog at all. So she opened the door, and the dog ran away. So this is really weird. But then the dog came back the next day as well, about the same time, ran into the house, sat in its favorite corner, went to sleep, and then when it wanted to leave, oh, oh. and then she opened the door and let it out. And this happened to three or four days. <laughs> That's a lovely story. Three or four days this happened. And then she thought, why does this dog keep doing this, come into my house? About the same time every afternoon, late afternoon. And just, it's a lovely dog. It's clean. You know, and obviously it had an owner there, but she couldn't actually know where that owner was. And so she thought, ah, I've got a good idea. She got out a piece of paper and wrote on it the story. Say, your dog comes to my house every afternoon for the past four or five days. I don't know why. 
It's very welcome. It's so well behaved. It's clean. It doesn't cause any, any trouble. It just goes into the corner of one of my rooms and has a snooze for a couple of hours. So it's welcome to come back again, but I just want to know why. Where, where, where does it come from? And anyway, she wrote that, folded it up, and put it in the collar. And then uh, the next day, the dog came back, and there was a note in there, it was an answer. <laughs> so she took the answer out, and the answer was, uh, I was wondering where my dog goes in the afternoon, but you know, my dog lives a couple of blocks away. We have a very big family, my wife, about five or six kids, some very young, they're always playing around, making so much noise and trying to play with the dog. And it's so noisy and so tense over here. The dog runs to your house to have a bit of peace and quiet. <laughs> P.S., said the husband, can I come too? That's the only reason the dog came there. Just some quiet. And they can understand that in our life. Sometimes just managing to find a place where you can just go in there and just relax to the max, have a good rest. That's incredibly powerful for your emotional well-being, for your softness and kindness, and you tend to see the world in a different way afterwards. And say, yes, sometimes that you get upset, sometimes the meditation doesn't go so well. But sometimes just you have a bit of peace and quiet, a bit of a rest, relaxation, you don't worry about things, you learn how to throw things away. And then you find it's easy to be peaceful. And then when you are peaceful, you find it's easy to understand the nature of life. And in all the years which I've been a monk, there's never I've never found any human being is evil, or even is crazy. All I've ever seen is people are tired, very tired. Because they're tired, they do stupid things. So, two more stories. The first story uh, is, of, again, these are emotional stories, because I remember the first time I said this, was uh, in Sulawesi, in Indonesia. And it was strange, but it was an interview for the, uh, the Muslim paper, uh, the, the Islamic paper. And it was this uh, Islamic uh, woman who was doing the interview for me. And when she was asking the questions, I was t telling the answers in stories. I remember this one because you know, she was trying her best just to listen and take the notes of what I was saying. But then she just burst out crying, started weeping. And it was weird because it touched exactly what she needed to hear. And you know, why do sort of people get angry? Why is there a problem with children in our community? She was asking. And I said the story about the, the man who came home late from work. When he got in the house, his six-year-old was waiting for him. Daddy, Daddy, how much do you earn at work? It's very strange from a six-year-old. Said, Daddy said, look, I'm tired. I've just, been, just got home. I had a really busy day in the office. Shut up, be quiet. But Daddy, how much do you earn at the office? Look, I'm tired. Be quiet. Leave me alone. Is that convincing, me raising my voice? Yes, <laughs> You were in the, like, the film industry, the acting. You had to give me some lessons. I don't get angry. <laughs> but Daddy, how many dollars do you want to work? Look, third time, you're grounded. Go to your room. You don't look scared, do you? <laughs> anyway, so he went up to his room, the little six-year-old, shrugging his shoulders. And the you know, daddy shouted at his child three times. And he felt guilty. And he only did that because he was exhausted and tired. When you are tired, you don't have time for people. So anyway, he 
He went back up. He went back up to his son's room, knocked on the door, opened the door and let himself in. And there was a child on the bed. And said, look, son, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I shouted at you. I shouldn't shout at you. I was just tired and exhausted. A really busy day at work. And I don't know why you want to know how much I earn per hour at work. But he said it was $20 an hour. And the child smiled really sweetly. Oh, thank you, Daddy. Now, can I borrow 10 bucks, please? <laughs> <laughs> and this poor father, he got angry once. He said, that's enough for this evening. I'm not going to get angry at you again. So he got out his wallet and took out a $10 bill and gave it to the son. Here you are, son, $10. Thank you, Daddy. And then the child opened the little drawer by his bedside. And he had another $10 in coins. He counted out the $10 in coins plus the $10 note which he just got from his dad. And he gave it to his father. Now, Daddy, can I please have one hour of your time? I remember at that, this was a lady, she wept. <laughs> she told me afterwards she was a single mum. She was looking after her kid and trying the very, 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 very best. And just sometimes you need stories like that to remember what a child really needs. There's an extra hour of the time with mummy and daddy when they're six years of age. So little by little, those types of stories are stories about life, priorities not getting angry, learning how to be kind, and learning how that kindness with wisdom does amazing things for your meditation and for your life. And the second story, the last story, which uh, then it's already nine o'clock. This is one of the stories I used to tell at every retreat at, towards the end. It's the story <laughs> of the professor and the sailor. Now, if ever you hear me tell stories about professors, the professors always end up as the, end up as the losers in these stories. <laughs> it's not that I've got anything about professors, but sometimes they're too much in their head and they miss out the important things of life. So anyway, this professor, he was a long time ago, he has been invited, you know, from uh, Perth to give a lecture in Singapore. And so, uh, first night at sea, he had his cabin, he had a dinner, and the dinner was a good dinner. And so after dinner, he went up on deck just to have a stroll. And as he was walking up on the deck, that is where he saw this old sailor. His hands were on the railings of the deck, looking out, or looking down into the ocean waters. And he thought, even I have a conversation with the old man. You know, you don't know these people who've been at sea for a long time. They may know something he didn't. So he asked the sailor, he said, how long have you been sailing in these ships? And the old sailor said, oh, ever since I was about a 14-year-old boy, I've been sailing these oceans all my life. Wow, said the professor, looking into the ocean. You know, one of my hobbies is marine science. All the animals, you know, the different types of fish and stuff which live in the ocean. You must have seen an amazing variety of uh, animals in this ocean. You must be almost an expert on marine science. Let's have a compare notes. And the old sailor said, marine what? <laughs> marine science. The animals which live, you know, in the oceans. The only animal I know lives in the ocean is a fish. <laughs> Different types of fish, well, all fish to me. <laughs> what, said the professor, you spent all the life at sea, never bothered to open up a book and learn about the life beneath you? <laughs> nope. <laughs> you stupid old man, said the professor, what a waste of a life. And he walked away. The next day, it was a really nice dinner. So he went up on deck again for a walk 
and this time he was in such a good mood. He saw, he saw the, the uh, old sailor looking up to the heavens, a beautiful clear night. He could see the whole of the Milky Way. And he said, even more important than marine science, I really have a great interest in astronomy. Astro what? <laughs> astronomy. And said, all oh, the stars above you, look, that's Alpha Centauri. Alpha what? <laughs> he said, oh man, these stars guide your ships in the days before, you know, GPS or whatever you have, or compasses. I thought you'd really be expert and know such a lot about, about the, the stars above you. I said, nope. Have you never opened up a book and learned about astro astronomy? Nope. <laughs> you stupid old man, you stupid old man. What a waste of a life. What a waste of a life. And the professor walked away in disgust, thinking he'll never ever speak to such a fool again. And the third night at sea, there was such a beautiful meal the cook made that evening. And it was just such a calm and still night. So when he walked up on deck, there was a slight breeze just wafting over the ocean. It was fragrant. And he was in such a good mood. He decided to give the old sailor a last chance. <laughs> he went up to the old sailor and told him, he said, you know, you know astronomy, marine science, they're the only hobbies. My expertise is meteorology. <laughs> what? <laughs> the weather. Oh, the weather. Because the weather that drives the sails of your ships. If the weather is calm like this evening, you don't make much progress, but you're safe. If there's a big storm, it can actually destroy the ship and blow you off course. The weather, you must know a lot about the weather. And I'm going to give a lecture in Singapore about meteorology. So let's have a discussion. <laughs> Meteor what? The weather, yes, yeah, windy sometimes, it's cold sometimes, it rains, that's about all the weather I know. You mean you've, you've never opened up a book and studied? Nope. You stupid old man. You stupid, you stupid old man. What a waste of a life. All these years you never learnt about the things around you. You stupid old man, what a waste of a life, what a waste of a life. What a waste of a life. And he vowed never to talk to the old man again and keep that vow. And the fourth night at sea, don't worry, this is the last. <laughs> <laughs> and the fourth night at sea, the professor never had dinner because it was a very windy night at sea. And he suffered from, from seasickness. So he didn't want to put anything in his stomach. It might just come straight out again. You know, just like in Sati Bhattana Sutta, what goes down goes up. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, should I? <laughs> but anyway, so he didn't have anything to eat. He was just laying in his cabin as the storm got worse and worse, as the clock ticked over, getting close to midnight. He really couldn't go to sleep because the ship was rocking and rocking and it was getting worse and worse. The storm was blowing more violently and the sea was rolling just more precariously. He was getting more and more scared, and he was really at the peak of... But bang! There was a big, loud noise. His heart almost stopped. And everything else was quiet for a second or two. Then he heard someone running right outside his cabin. In fear, he opened the door. And who did he see running outside his own cabin? The old sailor. And the old sailor stopped and turned around to the professor and said, Professor, in all your years of study, have you ever learned how to swim? <laughs> <laughs> and the professor said, well, actually, actually, no. <laughs> what? What a waste of a life. 
the ship is sinking. <laughs> <laughs> and that story is always to remind you, if you are a sailor, yes, you can learn about marine science, yeah, you can learn about astronomy, yeah, you can learn about the weather meteorology, but the most important thing to learn, if you go to sea, is how to swim. <laughs> So the most important thing to learn, if you're a human being born into this life, like literally how to keep your head above water, and to know so many things you can't control in this life. The things which you don't expect. And just to have so much gratitude that it's all, even if it hurts, it gives you so much opportunity to grow beautiful gardens with all the shit which comes in your life. It gives you wonderful opportunities to grow in compassion. You're not perfect, no one else is. So you can be at peace and kind to everybody. That's why you come on a retreat like this. That's what you learn. It's much more important to learn that. Kindness, forgiveness, peace, acceptance, embracing, and almost anything else. Learn how to swim, otherwise, what a waste of a life. <laughs> <laughs> sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay. So now we have some interviews. <laughs>